Ever wonder why, despite all our advancements in technology and science, there's a vast expanse of our own planet that we barely know about? Believe it or not, over 80% of our oceans remain uncharted territory. It's as if we've got this massive aquatic playground in our backyard and we've barely scratched the surface. Also, did you know that only about 7% of our oceans have a special tag called Marine Protected Areas, or MPAs? How come this colossal body of water that envelops most of our planet is also among the most vulnerable and misunderstood spaces in the universe? Pressure has a lot to do with it. Our deep ocean is a beast of a place with no visibility, freezing temperatures, and pressure that's so intense that in certain areas it would make you feel like you're having the weight of 50 jumbo jets on your body. No wonder we're having an easier time sending people into space than to the bottom of the ocean. The deeper you go into the waters, the more pressure piles up. But let's not forget we have tech on our side, right? Scientists now use these cool satellite technologies that track the color of the ocean to check how much phytoplankton is there, for example. Why is this important, you might ask? Because these little plant-like critters are actually pretty major players in our big blue oceans. In the grand scheme of things, in the aquatic world, phytoplankton is like the bedrock of the ocean food chain. It gives life to almost everything, from the tiny zooplankton, which are animal-like microorganisms, to those colossal, magnificent whales. When these technologies first came around, satellites could get clear images of the ocean faster than a ship could take the same number of measurements in 10 years. But it's not all about looking at the ocean from space. Sometimes you gotta dive in there and see it for yourself. Thankfully, we've come a long way in ocean exploration tech too. We've got things like floats and drifters that ride the ocean currents while collecting data and a whole fleet of underwater vehicles, some of which are manned, some remote controlled, and some even autonomous. Remember James Cameron, the guy who made the movie Titanic? He's super into exploring the ocean, and in 2012, he set a record by going down to the Mariana Trench in a vertical torpedo sub. He thinks there's nothing like being in the ocean and experiencing it firsthand. Other companies use a mix of technologies for their ocean explorations. It led them to discover amazing stuff like a deep sea coral reef near Morocco, the only one still growing in the Mediterranean Sea. They've also discovered new species and documented ones previously thought to live only in the Atlantic. These efforts have convinced the local authorities to declare some places as marine parks. As with most scientific areas, the road isn't without its bumps. These expeditions can cost quite a lot, and the lack of detailed maps and data only adds to the challenge. We can't always rely on bathymetric information, meaning the study of the ocean floor, because it's often not available. And that's the tricky part. We need to explore more to know more. But getting the funds for these kinds of projects can be tough when there are so many unknown variables. One particular company's explorations have helped protect nearly 4 million square miles of ocean so far. The data they collect during their expeditions is invaluable. It's used to identify new species, locate vulnerable habitats, and even show where threatened species are being overlooked. Their work helps dismiss excuses from local authorities who claim they lack the necessary information to establish more MPAs. The same company supports a goal known as 30 by 30, aiming to protect 30% of our oceans by 2030. It's a big target and there's a long road ahead, but ongoing ocean exploration can provide the proof needed to keep more of our oceans safe. We also need to set aside areas for protection and research even when we don't have all the facts just yet. On that note, some cool scientists have recently stumbled upon a gigantic and mysterious world beneath the Pacific Northwest Coast's ocean floor. The best part is, this massive realm of life is pretty much cut off from the rest of the world above, making it like a secret underground club that only the best microbiologists have access to. Picture an active city. Except the city is microscopic cracks in the basalt rocks of our oceanic crust, and its residents are microbes. These tiny creatures aren't like you and me.
they don't rely on sunlight or the organic products of land and water ecosystems for sustenance. Instead, they thrive on chemical reactions with rocks and seawater. Scientists call this type of life chemosynthetic, which sounds complicated, but it basically means life sustained by chemical reactions. While this sort of life has been found deep in mines and around seafloor hydrothermal vents, the scale at which these creatures are found under the oceanic crust is unprecedented. It might even be the most extensive ecosystem on Earth. A geomicrobiologist from Denmark was part of the team that made this discovery. He claimed that over 50% of our planet's surface is oceanic crust, which is an average of 4 miles thick. Imagine the size of this chemosynthetic party happening down there. This discovery didn't happen overnight. Since the 90s, scientists have found weird tiny holes in the basalt rocks that make up much of Earth's outer crust. They seem like they might have been made by bacteria. But hey, there was supposed to be no life there. I mean, imagine trying to survive in a place that's hot, deep, dark, dense, and mostly devoid of the organic compounds we need for life. Yet, here they are. In the following years, more pieces of the puzzle fell into place. Scientists found that the oceanic crusts had different conditions at the centers and edges. At the centers, rocks are jam-packed with energy-rich compounds that support these tiny life forms. But by the time they reach the edges, these chemicals are all gone. Fast forward to now, and it's time to put the puzzle together. A microbial ecologist from the University of North Carolina worked on this research and says we now have solid evidence of microbial life in the cracks and crevices of deep ocean basalt. The next question scientists asked was, how far does this life extend? Researchers collected samples of crust from a plate roughly 120 miles off of Washington's coast, drilling deep beneath the ocean's surface. What they found down there was remarkable. The life down there runs on a unique fuel, hydrogen. Yep, in the absence of sunlight, hydrogen provides the energy for all their biological processes. These microbes use hydrogen to transform carbon dioxide into organic matter. This matter and other byproducts, like methane, then fuel other organisms, creating a network of life. Of course, the life down there isn't as complex as the one we know up here. Scientists doubt there will be any multicellular life under the ocean because it's too hot and energy poor. But hey, who knows? This universe under our oceans still has a lot to reveal. This whole thing is significant for many reasons. First, it confirms that life can exist in places without oxygen, which changes our perspective on where we can find life. This makes us wonder if life could exist under similar conditions on other planets where surface conditions might be too harsh. The implications on Earth are also profound. If a large portion of life exists in the oceanic crust, then our understanding of life on our own planet could be completely changed. This exciting discovery stretches our understanding of life and prompts us to keep exploring the mysterious depths of our oceans, pushing the limits of our understanding. NASA is also in on the whole deep sea exploration project. Why? Shouldn't they be preoccupied with outer space? Because they're hoping to find hints about what the oceans on other planets might look like. NASA specialists are really hopeful that by unearthing underwater secrets, we can solve some of the big questions about space. Plus, they're testing some nifty equipment for future journeys across our solar system. A wanderer walking through a desert feels the scorching sun like never before. You can see him from afar thanks to his shining clothes. His long hoodie is covered with foil. It reflects sunlight and protects him from heat. The ground is so hot that shoe soles can melt on it. That's why the wanderer's boots are covered with heat-resistant material. A cloudless sky, barren land, and heat. But the wanderer is not in the desert. He's walking on the ocean's bottom. He doesn't know why this happened, but all the oceans on Earth dried up. It happened almost instantly, and even the greatest minds in the world don't know why. The wanderer knows only one thing. When it happened, his family was on the other side of the ocean. For several months, he's been traveling across this lifeless land. 
and he won't stop until he finds his family. The landscape around is spectacular. People have finally found out the secrets of the ocean depths. The seabed consists of huge mountain ranges and volcanoes. They fell asleep forever after the water had disappeared. Also, there are huge trenches leading to the unexplored depths of the planet. People had to build bridges to get over these enormous cracks in the ground. But most of the ocean floor is flat plains, boundless, lifeless, merciless. The wanderers walking across a huge canyon. Once, it was swarming with sea life. The man puts on a gas mask, but not because of a sandstorm. Many fish and other marine inhabitants used to live in such canyons. Now, all that's left is a terrible smell. The wanderer passes by huge skeletons of whales. Among them, he notices dirty tents. People are hiding there from heat. The temperature in the area is much higher than in the Sahara Desert. One of the main functions of the ocean was to distribute heat all over the planet. The sun emits heat and radiation. The ocean absorbed this energy. Lots of currents were warm, and they carried this warmth around the world. The water got heated at the equator, then it evaporated and turned into clouds. When warm air rose, it pulled along colder air from below. This allowed the energy to be evenly distributed. In simple words, the ocean cooled hot places and brought warmth to cold ones. Now there's none of this. Every day the sun burns the equator and dries up the rest of the planet. The wanderer doesn't come close to the tents. He is carrying the most valuable treasure in the world and doesn't want people to notice him. The inhabitants of Earth are just trying to survive, and many have forgotten about such a thing as morality. Fortunately, the wanderer still remembers. The thoughts of the family help him remain a good person. Sometimes it complicates his life. Like now, for example. In the distance, he sees a young girl. She doesn't look well. There's no one around, and the wanderer decides to help her. Out of his backpack, he pulls a thing worth more than all the gold on the planet, a bottle of water. The girl takes a few sips, but instead of thanking the wanderer, she starts screaming. It's a trap. Her accomplices appear from different sides. Looters, they're gonna take everything. The wanderer runs away. He hasn't eaten for several days, and his strength is leaving him. He won't be able to keep going much longer. The marauders are closing in on him. The wanderer throws the bottle aside. His pursuers rush to the water like crazy. They forget about the man and fight one another for the bottle. The chances of the wanderer's survival have greatly decreased. He could make this bottle last at least several days. Plus, he's also lost a lot of fluid because of running. In the beginning, there was no panic because of a lack of water. The ocean dried up, but its waters were salty anyway. People still had seas, lakes, and rivers. But the problem was that the ocean was feeding them. When the ocean water evaporated, it formed clouds. These clouds moved all over the world and enriched lakes and rivers with rain. Now, there are almost no clouds. The sun started heating Earth much more. Lakes and seas dried up alarmingly quickly. At that moment, real chaos began. The sun is going down on the horizon. Sunset is near. It's not so hot anymore. The exhausted wanderer continues walking. In the distance, he notices something that makes him stop, take out a small shovel, and start digging quickly. There's no shelter around, just a flat plain. The wanderer speeds up, otherwise it might be too late. The pit is finally ready. The man jumps down and covers his head with a cloak. A few seconds later, a strong ash storm passes through the entire plain. The smallest particles of ash can penetrate through clothes and get into the lungs. The wind is so strong that it can knock anyone down. When the oceans dried up, the sun began to burn the surface of the planet. This led to massive forest fires. The flames destroyed almost all the trees. Huge clouds of carbon dioxide and ash formed, driven by the wind. They travel the world and poison everything around. The wanderer is sitting in the pit while a terrible hurricane is sweeping over his head. He thinks of his family and slowly falls asleep. Cold wakes him up. Frosty air chills him to the bone. So it's night now. The wanderer climbs out of the pit and finds himself under bright stars. As soon as the water dried up, almost all clouds disappeared. Factories stopped working. Cars no longer emitted carbon dioxide, thanks to this. 
Comets and the most distant stars can be seen in the sky. The Wanderer has seen them a thousand times, but he's still not used to the breathtaking picture. It's like he's looking at the sky through a telescope. An icy gust of wind brings the Wanderer back to reality. He won't survive the night if he doesn't find a warmer place. Before, nights were warmer thanks to the energy of the ocean. Now, as soon as the sun goes down, temperatures drop dramatically. The Wanderer needs to move to stay warm. He starts walking faster. Soon, he notices some lights in the distance. It's probably other looters. The Wanderer goes deeper into the valley. Stars in the moon illuminate his way. Unfortunately, he is running out of energy. He pulls a protein bar out of his pocket, but he needs at least a bit of water to eat it. To digest food, your body needs liquid. If the Wanderer eats the bar, he'll only get thirstier. He can't walk and falls to the ground. He checks his pockets and finds a small kerosene tablet. He lights it using a matchstick. A tiny flame protects him from cold. To distract himself from thirst, the Wanderer takes out an old MP3 player. He charged it during the day using the solar panels on his backpack. The man puts on headphones. Classical music calms him down. He lies on the ground next to the burning tablet. He needs to gain strength to continue his journey tomorrow. It's morning. In an hour, the sun will start burning the ground again. It's crucial to find water while he still has some time left. The wanderer inspects the territory and notices a spot where the ground is darker. In his previous life, the wanderer worked as a surveyor. He takes a few steps and touches the ground. It feels cool. There's an underground spring here. He begins to dig. The ground is getting wet. Water starts seeping out of the soil. The wanderer fills his empty bottles. Things don't look that bad anymore. It's getting a bit more difficult to breathe with each new day. In the past, phytoplankton and algae produced up to 70% of all the oxygen on the planet, but not anymore. Several days have passed. The wanderer runs out of water and food again. Fortunately, not for long. He's now walking among huge sunken ships. He sees modern aircraft carriers, liners, and even ancient pirate boats. In the distance, he spots huge mountains. The tops of these rocks are what used to be called the shore. The ocean floor is ending. The thoughts about reuniting with his family give him more strength. The man reaches the top and finds himself in the middle of a ruined city. It's empty. Where have all the people gone? Where is my family now? The wanderer asks himself. The man walks through the abandoned streets and meets an old man. He says that almost all the people who used to live here left the city and went to Antarctica. The Wanderer has a new goal. He's going to get to the icy mainland no matter what. He will find his family. For years, scientists have been struggling to explain bizarre sounds. Some repeating, some heard only once, that come from the dark depths of the ocean. From bewildering hums to worrying bloops, the water transmits outlandish acoustic phenomena. One of these mysterious noises got named the upsweep. For the first time, this long train of sounds was registered in 1991 in the Pacific Ocean. One of the most unusual things about this signal is that it keeps changing, as if trying to confuse researchers even more. Like some unearthly howl, it varies from high to low frequencies and then back again, and you can hear it better in the spring and fall than in the winter and summer. Why the upsweep? It's simple. The sound travels from the bottom of the ocean towards its surface, as if sweeping up. Scientists do have a theory explaining this phenomenon. The activity of undersea volcanoes. Hot lava pouring into ice-cold ocean water could theoretically create such noises, but there's no proof found yet. Plus, the sound has been declining since 1991, even though it can still be detected. The bloop is the name given to an ultra-low frequency and incredibly powerful underwater sound that was recorded in 1997 by the U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. The bloop continued for approximately one minute. Having started from a low rumble, it gradually rose in frequency. 
It also kind of mimicked the noise created by marine animals, but its volume was so great that no living creature known to science could have made it. When the bloop occurred, underwater microphones managed to record it from a distance of 3,000 miles away. Rumor has it that the noise might have something to do with the fictional half-octopus monster Cthulhu or some other colossal deep-water creature. But if you don't believe in monsters, science has another explanation. Iceberg fracturing. The thing is that ice quakes recorded in the Scotia Sea resemble the mysterious bloop a bit too much for it to be a coincidence. The whistle resembles this annoying sound when a kettle of boiling water is telling you it's time to make a cup of tea. But even though it may not be as blood-curdling as some other bizarre ocean sounds, it doesn't make it any less mysterious. Plus, the whistle is very elusive. In 1997, only one underwater microphone was able to pick it up, and therefore, researchers didn't manage to pinpoint the source of the noise. The most likely cause of the sound is an eruption of one of the submarine volcanoes. Have you ever heard of Julia? No, not your neighbor. I'm talking about this otherworldly sound. Listen to it. It was recorded in 1999 by the U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. The source of the sound was most likely a large iceberg that ran aground somewhere in Antarctica. The sound was so loud that it was heard over a huge territory, and its duration was about 2 minutes and 43 seconds. Slow down. That's the name given to a sound recorded in 1997 in the equatorial Pacific Ocean. The sound was called this way because it slowly decreased in frequency over seven minutes or so. It's been picked out a few more times since it was recorded for the first time. The source of the sound isn't very mysterious. Most likely, it was produced by a massive iceberg that became grounded in Antarctica, or it was caused by moving ice. By that, I mean the friction produced by a large ice sheet moving over land. The loneliest whale sound is often called the 52 hertz whale because the animal that creates it calls at a unique for these creatures frequency. When you listen to this sound, it sounds like a low bass note. At the same time, it's much higher than the normal frequency of the whale call, which rings between 10 and 40 hertz. Interestingly, scientists have been listening to the world's loneliest whale for decades but haven't managed to figure out its precise location. Nobody knows whether the mammal is male or female, what species it is, or if the animal is still alive. After all, for the last time, its call was recorded in 2004. Earth-shaking booming sounds have been reverberating off some parts of North Carolina for more than 150 years. Called Seneca guns, they're most often heard near the coast. The sounds are so powerful that they often rattle window panes and sometimes vibrate entire buildings. They can last from 1 to almost 10 seconds. Even though scientists haven't cracked this mystery yet, there are some theories. They range from earthquakes to severe distant storms and quarry blasts. But even though the ground trembles every time the phenomenon occurs, no seismic activity coincides with these events. So far, scientists have come to the conclusion that the mysterious sounds happen in the atmosphere, not on or under the surface of our planet. If this theory is true, bolides might be the answer. These extremely bright meteors often explode once they enter Earth's atmosphere. Or Seneca guns might be born in the ocean. Sometimes, when enormous waves collide far away from the shore, you can hear it, even if you're nowhere near the coast. Seneca guns are a type of skyquakes. You don't need to travel to a particular part of the world to hear one of those. Mysterious sonic booms ramble from the sky everywhere, from the US to India and Japan. Just like Seneca guns, this sound phenomenon occurs mostly near the coast or a big body of water. Rattling glassware and windows in the nearby houses, skyquakes could be connected with ultra-fast airplanes breaking the sound barrier. But people started hearing the first skyquakes in 1824. 
The theories trying to explain this phenomenon include sand dunes shifting, meteors entering the atmosphere, distant volcanoes erupting, Earth's crust cracking during earthquakes, and even gas bursting out of underground vents in the sea or lake bottom. In different countries all over the world, people get paralyzed with fear after hearing otherworldly trumpet sounds that seem to be coming from the sky. The inhabitants of the US, Canada, Australia, Germany, and the Philippines have already heard this hair-raising noise since it was first recorded in 2008. These sounds are sometimes called the sound of apocalypse. And although until recently, nobody could understand the origin of the sounds, NASA claims that there is nothing to be afraid of. The noise can be coming from our own planet. Usually, it's quiet and thus inaudible to the human ear. But when it gets louder, the outcome is the very trumpet sounds that scare people all over the world. Bristol Hum started in the 1970s when hundreds of Bristol inhabitants began to talk about a bizarre noise audible only at night. The noise was a low-level hum, and nobody could identify or trace the source of the sound. But the strangest thing about the noise was that one day, it stopped as abruptly as it started. But not before people in other towns across Britain reported hearing similar sounds. Some time ago, the mysterious sound returned. In 2015, a group of French scientists claimed that they had solved the mystery of the Bristol hum. They stated that the culprit was ocean waves that made the ocean floor vibrate. But while it was all good and well, it didn't explain why the sound was around for only several years or why it chose to return. If you ever come to the town of Taos in New Mexico, don't let another strange and unexplained phenomenon send you running for the hills. This phenomenon is a faint, low-frequency hum ringing in the desert air and grating on your nerves. Even stranger, only 2% of people who live in Taos hear this noise. But for those who do, it's unstoppable torture. On top of that, everyone describes the sound in a different way, from a quiet whir to an eerie hum or even persistent buzz. And while some people believe that the Taos hum is the result of unusual acoustics, the others suspect a bad case of mass hysteria. No one has located the origin of the hum yet. <laughs>